Okay, here we go. All right, as you can see, today we are talking about the best way to learn English vocabulary for fluency. All right, I think we are live. I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com. And I know a lot of people want to learn a lot of vocabulary, so I want to talk about in this video how to do it the right way. Well, I know I, I like to say the right way. A lot of people might have different methods, but this is the thing that has worked best for me uh, and many of my students. So hopefully you enjoy this. All right, uh, let me know in the chat if you are here. Just type something so I can know that the chat is working. We should be okay and we should be ready to go. Uh, this video actually should not take too long. All right, seated. Hello. Nice to see you there. <laughs> okay, chat is working. All right, uh, so this video actually should not take too long. It's a pretty quick explanation. I don't want to make it complicated for people because really fluency actually is very simple uh, if you learn things the right way. So I want to talk about actually the four different levels of vocabulary learning in this video, what normally uh, people do in a traditional lesson, and then how natives are doing this as well. So hopefully this should be exciting and interesting for people. I want to get right into it and I will as always stay around for a little bit to answer questions anybody has, uh, but hopefully this should be entertaining. Uh, so the goal again is to develop a vocabulary for fluency. That's really the important thing about this video. So this is not about studying for a test and you need to learn a bunch of things as quickly as possible and you can forget them after the test. So the point is how do we learn something and then actually remember that information. So we're going to talk about uh, techniques for doing things and we're also going to talk about a little bit of psychology as well. Uh, I love to talk about that because how you think is very important to how you get fluent. All right, so I'm going to do these in reverse order. If we can imagine this uh, like a staircase almost. Uh, so very simply, we've got about uh, four levels and you might have some kind of intermediate steps, but these are the main things here. Uh, so if we begin, uh, we're gonna put like one, two, three, and four down here. And we'll cover all four, starting with the lowest level, the thing that's really going to get you fluent, uh, probably not ever, <laughs> uh, but it could help you learn a lot of the language. And that's the first level, which is translations. I'll put this down here. So the first level of vocabulary learning where you're trying to get some information as quickly as possible is just to get a translation of that information. So if I'm trying to learn Japanese, I get, uh, I don't know what a word is, I just go in an English Japanese dictionary and look up the translation of that. That's going to be the fastest way for me to get that information. The problem is that I will likely forget that information later. So if you're learning a language through translations, you will use those translations when you speak. You will be thinking, okay, do I have the right translation for that word? Uh, and often when you're learning through translations in this way, you have a one-to-one connection between the vocabulary in your language and the language like English you're trying to learn. So we don't want to do that. We're going to talk about creating a web rather than that, but we'll just put these little kind of glasses symbol down here to just talk about translations. So I learned the word snow in English and I, or I know the word snow in English and I'm trying to learn Thai or Chinese or something and I learn just the definition of that thing uh, or the translation of that. So again, if you're learning through translations, this is a quick way to learn a language, especially for a test, but it's really uh, going to make it much more difficult if you're trying to communicate fluently. The next level up here, we're going to have definitions. Uh, and so if I go into a dictionary, I might even do this in English. So I'm getting an English to English dictionary definition of some word. So if I'm an English learner, it doesn't matter what my native language is, but my, I'm trying to just get a definition of something. This is another quick way to learn the, you know, the, the definition of a word you want to know what it means, but it's not really sticking with you. Often people, you will see these in lessons where uh, a typical language lesson, you will get maybe a definition of something, maybe some examples, and that's it. But you're not really learning a lot of the history uh, or maybe the culture behind something or depending on the vocabulary, uh, why we might use something. So as an example, uh, like if I get the definition of a word, if I'm trying to tell my, my children, like I'm teaching them just 
the, the native English language the way I would teach them normally, I could give them a definition uh, if I asked them to turn on the light. So as an example, I turn on the light. So if I tell them turn on the light and they say, oh no, what does turn on mean? And I just say, oh, where you, you know, you move the switch up like that to turn on the light. But the interesting thing about this word is we have this vocabulary. This is a phrasal verb here to turn something on. We have this because years ago you would have machines with a switch that was a dial like this. So we would turn that thing on. Like an old television set, usually it had a dial like this. Uh, and you would kind of turn it to maybe like off and then turn it to on and then it would have a few different channels on it. Today's televisions have, I don't know, thousands of channels or digital whatever, uh, but years ago there were only like three or four channels on the TV. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty funny to think about it now. Uh, so if you get a little bit more understanding about that, ah, now I, I realize why we use turn on even though we might be pushing a button or sliding something on a phone, something like that. So when you get a definition, again, that's better than a translation, especially if you're learning it in English, uh, but it's still not as high as the, the other things we're going to talk about now, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. Let me just check uh, chat before I continue here, make sure people are, are listening, that I'm coming in clearly over here. All right, well, it's good to see everybody here. Hello from uh, Canada. All right, people from California, Dubai, listening to you keenly. Very good. Uh, Paulina from Poland, uh, Karachi, Pakistan. How are you? I'm from Algeria. Look at that. It's, it's like one person from every country. <laughs> Amazing. See, this says, uh, Drew, I'm glad I can learn a lot from you. Thanks so much. I'm watching the old videos. They are still so useful. Yes, so I try to make content that is evergreen, evergreen. It's another good vocabulary word for you. All right, so this is, if I give you a definition, here's a perfect example of this, uh, of this, like, of, like what I'm teaching you right now. So the word evergreen. What does that mean? Can anybody post in the chat? I'll look down through a few more comments, but this is a really good example of, of a vocabulary lesson right here uh, that's something natives would use that a lot of non-natives do not. Uh, so if you know what this means, let me know in the chat, uh, but I'll, I'll teach a quick lesson about that just for this, this example here. Um, but yeah, all, all the content is, is designed to, to be learned. It doesn't matter when you're learning it. So I might have a few things. I don't know, I, I made some silly video about like the president election uh, in 2016, I think. Uh, but most of it is uh, evergreen, all right? So if you have an idea about what evergreen is, post that uh, in the chat. All right, hello from Africa, Tanzania. Nice to see you there. Max says, uh, Mr. English, Mr. English, <laughs> watch your videos. Uh, on and off since 2015. You're awesome. Well, thank you very much. Mohammed from Iraq. Nice to see you. Brett, I've been watching your videos for weeks. I can say that your way of teaching English is just awesome. Glad to hear. Hi. Let's see. Uh, Faikun. Fai Faikun. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you there. Uh, Yadav from India. Go Brazil. Greetings from Mexico, Canada. Over green trees. Greeting from Congo. Do you have Japanese students who learn with you in loco? Uh, no, I do not. I do not have uh, regular live lesson. Uh, I'm saying I'm <laughs> I combine li uh, lesson and class at the same the same word. So no live lessons. I don't have a classroom uh, that I teach. Sometimes I will help with friends of mine if they are teaching something. I might go to their class, and I did that. A friend of mine was sick, and I taught his class in his place. That that was a lot of fun. We just, you know, it's good to, to meet and talk with students. That's another reason why I do these live videos. I really enjoy teaching. And because I don't have a class, I can work with people like this. So I can talk with you all here. Evergreen is something that lasts forever. Yes, that's correct. Why? All right, so this is the difference here. All right, so let's begin. If we have the word evergreen, which is a really useful word, I recommend you remember it, and I'm going to help you remember it with this uh, lesson right now. Uh, so evergreen means, if I'm just going to give you a definition of it, it means something that lasts forever. So if I give you the definition, so ever, so equals, if I'm just going to give a definition, like very simply, it lasts forever. Or another way to describe that might be timeless. So something that's timeless, it's, it's great anytime. So it doesn't matter if it's old or new, evergreen melodies, yep. 
Uh, so if I give you a translation of that, I might just say, okay, this means like timeless, and I'm giving you that in your native language. That's not really going to help you remember it. It would, it would kind of, oh, okay, I understand what that means, but it would not make it very memorable to help you develop fluency, which is the point of the video. All right, definitions again, I'm just gonna give that. Uh, but if we go to the next level up, this is a native lesson. Now a native lesson, by native lesson, I mean lessons that uh, parents are trying to really help uh, their children typically uh, understand something. And it's not just to teach them a definition because parents will be lazy, you know. We, so the kids often ask, what does this mean? And a parent will just say, oh, that means this. They're just giving their kids a definition. So native speakers do this too, all right? But you're doing a disservice to your kids by just giving them a definition when it's much better to give them a native lesson. And by that, I mean you're actually taking time to explain why, like I mentioned before, about a little bit of the history of something, why we actually do things. So in the case of evergreen, we have evergreen trees, evergreen trees. So this kind of tree is actually called an evergreen. So ever, like always, forever, it's always green. So any, any season, it could be spring, summer, winter, fall, it's always got the green leaves on it. So this is like a pine tree, and there are different kinds of uh, trees like this, but they're always green all year round, all right? So we have uh, other kinds of trees. Uh, the technical term, I think, is deciduous, deciduous. Uh, for this kind of tree, and these are the trees that lose their leaves in the fall. All right, so we have evergreen trees, these are pine trees, that kind of thing. Uh, but the point is we can take this vocabulary and then apply it to other things. Like I might have evergreen lessons, or I want to have evergreen content, meaning that it doesn't matter when people go and watch that. All right, so you'll notice obviously the difference here moving from definitions to the native lesson is I'm, I'm spending more time. So it takes more time, it takes more energy, uh, but the, the reward for that is that the student actually remembers the word and then they can use it later. And so again, if you're learning this way, uh, evergreen, now you can start using that in many different, many different situations. So when you really understand vocabulary well, this is how you become fluent in that vocabulary. So notice a few things again, like we're, we're moving up here. Uh, it's a little bit, it gets a little bit slower as we move up, but it, it actually builds speed over time uh, as you're learning and building, building fluency. So the more words that you learn higher up, uh, like these level three and level four things, these are the, uh, going to be the things that get you fluent fastest, okay? So even though it might be a definition is the fastest thing you can get immediately, if you're taking time getting native lessons and the next thing I'm going to teach, the highest level, uh, really the best thing you can do to get fluent, uh, these are the things that will get you fluent the fastest, okay? So evergreen, very good uh, usage, very good word here. Uh, so something can be evergreen, like a, a food could be evergreen, a speech could be evergreen if it doesn't matter when people use it, okay? It's timeless, all right? So the next level up, uh, again, we're moving along here. We've only been about... Uh, like, wow, like 13 minutes. This is going to be a really fast video, I think. So Evergreen uh, Melodies, I'll answer a few more questions before I... So Dr. Fatima, can you give us practical example of definition, translation, applying on a word? Okay, uh, so this one is pretty easy, and there's, there's not really a lot to explain about giving translations or giving a definition. It's just really uh, like a one-to-one. -one. Let me erase Evergreen up here. So if I give you a definition of something, it just means I'm going to take something in your language and tell you that same word in English, all right? So if I say like, uh, I don't know, like, like rest or whatever it is, pick, a, pick a, a word in your native language and just say, what is the English word for that? You can get a translation in your native language, okay? Evergreen appearance, yeah. So lots of things, and you could look for many different examples of this, but each one you would think, oh wow, like that's evergreen. So that's an evergreen usage of something. Evergreen is actually evergreen vocabulary because you can use it really any time. All right, so when we have a translation, it's just going from your language 
to English. It doesn't matter. Like you take one word and translate it into another language. So there's not really a lot to explain for this. And this is why translations uh, are really the thing that people use in most classes. And you'll see a lot of people teaching online. They will give translations of words because it's fast. Okay. All right. Say car, we translate Sayara. Oh, okay. So you, like the word car is translated into say, Sayara, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So I just the Japanese example of this. So if I'm going to say like you're a, you're a Japanese person learning the word car, this is the target word. And I'm trying to teach you that it's like, okay, this is Kuruma. 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 So the Japanese word Kuruma is car. All right. But if I teach you this way, you are probably going to forget. Really, the way most people remember this is because they've heard it so many times. Oh, Tsubasa from Yokohama is back. Nice to see you there. Hello. All right, good to see some more, uh, more people joining us. All right, let's see here from Somalia, Sri Lanka. Could we use this word in a negative? Uh, yep, yep, yep. So spoken English official says. Uh, could we use this word in a negative or with a negative connotation? That's true. Or ne in, in a negative situation. So yes, it could have a, uh, a, 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 an evergreen problem. Typically, it's more for positive things, but you could say that. You could talk about a perennial problem. Uh, so something uh, or like a constant problem if you, if you just need something more simple. Uh, but yes, so you can have evergreen, like an evergreen issue, an evergreen problem. Uh, but typically, we use it more for... Um, for positive things. But very good question. So this, as you see, when we go kind of deeper, when you get a native lesson, the, the point is to, is to answer questions that you have because it's the doubts you have that stop you from speaking. All right. So if you learn a new word and you're like, well, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, like kuruma could mean something else. Maybe I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say. What kind of car am I talking about? We don't really know. Um, so this is why translations are useful, again, for learning something very quickly. But if we're thinking long term about you being able to communicate, we don't want to use them. And so definitions are the same thing. It's just usually a uh, definition in the language. So you might like think, OK, definition of uh, like car, I would I would give you a like an explanation of that word but I might not share the history or why we use that word or really try to help you understand it like a native, okay? So remember that even natives will give definitions to kids, as I explained a little bit ago. So parents, maybe they're, they're busy and their children, like my kids, they ask me words all the time. Hey, what does this mean? What does that mean? And so I'd rather not give them a definition. I want to give them a native lesson and really help them understand that thing, okay? So I really want to make it clear what something means. All right, nice to see everybody here. All right, so we got more. Okay, more. It's a little blurry, though. Hi, everyone. Hello, Drew from India. Hello, Maya. Nice to see you there. All right, well, everybody get this so far? Pretty easy. All right, so we had our, our native lesson with Evergreen. I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, we'll give some more examples. Uh, but let's move on to the highest level. Now, for this one, I want to see if anybody knows what this is. So just put this in the chat. This will be a little quiz for people. Uh, if you've been learning with me for a while, you might have heard me talking about this already. Uh, but this should be uh, a very interesting thing. This is kind of the highest level of, of the psychology uh, and language learning. And if you can use this, if you can take advantage of this, uh, then you can actually learn more uh, words much faster. You will make great connections in your mind. Uh, notice again, as we're, as we're working up here, the, the goal is to create more connections in your mind. Uh, and the, the learning, the more connections you have, the easier it is uh, for you to learn things. So again, we begin with translations. I'll just put a T here and an E here for English. Uh, and then we have another, again, one-to-one -one thing, but it's English into English. So typically we would have a translation and then we have the, like, I'm just going to give you a definition of a word. Uh, and then the native lesson, really, we're trying to give you, trying to give you almost building, building a network here of a couple of different things, even a simple thing, like I did with the example of evergreen, okay? So we begin with the word evergreen. So we have the word evergreen. I won't write it in here, it won't fit. Uh, but we're trying to help you make a connection between different things and show that, oh, look at that. Here's the origin of the word. It comes from evergreen trees. 
And so we can use that. Oh, look at that. The trees are green all year round. That's why we talk about evergreen. It's always green. But we also have, you know, evergreen stories. We could have evergreen music, evergreen lessons, other things like that, where we have content that is timeless. So the point is we can take this and this is how people create language. So they take words and they use those meanings to describe something else. Say, oh, wow, that, that's, that's like a, like you might have a beautiful dress for a wedding or something that's, that many people have used for years. It's evergreen. Everybody likes to use that style. It never goes out of style. So clothing, fashion, you might have different things that go out of style over time. So they're in style for a while and they go out of style. So notice I'm building more and more connections with the word, with other words to help you make it uh, very memorable and that's how you can use it fluently. All right, let's see if anybody got the answer for number four. So I'll go back and check the chat right quick. All right, uh, but any, anyway, uh, even, even if you only get native lessons, these are fantastic. You will naturally get the, the highest one uh, over here, but let's see if anybody got what that is. Imitation, says Magali, Ma Magali, if I'm not, I'm not pronouncing, I can't read that properly. Magilum, if I'm pronouncing that correctly or incorrectly. Imitation, no, we are not, uh, we are not just imitating people. Elena again, konnichiwa, I'm so happy to see you. Nice to see you there. Uh, here for the first time, so always green, evergreen, great, uh, great sample, yes. Fantastic, Well, the shark is back. All right, any idea? Any idea? No one, no idea? You guys are probably doing this already without, without uh, not thinking about it. All right, all right, here we go. I'm gonna write the word here. Now you might be surprised when you see this, but I'll explain a little bit more about what this is. Discovery. Now, here's why this is so important. When we discover something for ourselves, this is like a very deep, uh, psychological idea about how people learn. You will see it everywhere around the world. This is not just about language learning. This is really about having beliefs uh, and really how strongly we believe in something is usually based on whether uh, we discovered that thing for ourselves or somebody else told us a particular belief. Okay, so here's how this works. Usually, I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick story to explain this, uh, but you should discover how it's working for yourself. So a few, I don't remember, maybe it was a few months ago, my two daughters, so I have two daughters, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and they were watching a TV show and they came uh, into my room and they said, Dad, what's space? What's space? So they're asking me for a word. What does that mean? Okay, now I could give them a, like a, a translation in Japanese because they maybe understand that. They probably, it's probably better just to teach it in English because they're my children and I'm teaching them English in English, but it's possible to do that. So I could give them, if they already know, you know, whether they're children or not, if they already know a word in one language, it's easy to just tell them the translation of a word. Or I could give them a definition and say just like, oh, space is, it's like, look, like here's some space right here. It's you know, just like an area of something. But I want to give them a native lesson and really lead them to this higher level, which is discovery. All right. So by beginning with the native lesson, this is where I'm starting again. I'll draw this again here. I'm trying to make different connections from things so that they can begin discovering things for themselves. And this is how the learning really accelerates. So again, translations are fastest first, but uh, discovery and native lessons are the things that will really get you to fluency much faster. Okay, so we begin making these. Uh, I'm like, oh, okay, it's space. And I say, where did you hear that? Where did you hear that? And they tell me, oh, it's from a TV show. And they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, they have a rocket. Here's my bad rocket. And the rocket is going up into space. And I say, oh, like outer space. So we have like here's the, the earth or whatever. And we got, you know, a rocket going up like that into space in this space up here, space. So we have uh, in this example, I'm trying to talk about just not by giving them a definition of it, but again, the native lesson where we're really taking time uh, to help them really understand the word, because it doesn't matter if I give them a translation or a definition, if they forget that, that that doesn't help them. 
All right. So again, we're giving them some different definitions. I say, look, if I, if I have my hands like this, I close my hands, there's space in my hands. Now, if I flatten my hands, there's no space. Actually, I still have a marker cap here. But if I take this, I close my hands together, whoop, there's no space in there. But now I've got some space. Okay, so no space, now some space. There's even some space inside this marker cap. Look at that, just a little bit of space there, okay? So yes, visual aids, this is an, again, one way of helping them understand even something like this. But space, like I could be, I could have some space in my head. You know, maybe I'm not thinking very clearly, I'm feeling spacey, like spaced out. It's another advanced uh, phrasal verb to be spaced. So you can imagine like a rocket going out into space, I might, oh, I'm feeling a little bit spacey. I'm kind of spaced out right now. Meaning I'm, I'm not focusing on the here and now, I'm thinking about something else, all right? So someone who is easily thinking about other things or they get distracted easily, they can be a little bit spacey or they get spaced out, okay? So again, the, the point we're, we're moving it's not just like getting examples. We're trying to help people build a network with various ideas. So I at least want to get like one, two, three things in there, hopefully more, depending on how much time I have. But this is the way I'm teaching my kids, all right? So how does discovery come into this, all right? So with enough native lessons that really help you understand something, we begin now, oh, there's a different thing that you can make uh, like the discovery yourself about and you feel very excited about when that happens. So as I'm explaining this to my daughters, my younger daughter, uh, she says, oh, like, uh, actually, or maybe that was Ari, I forget which one it was, but she said, oh, that's like a space, spaceship. She said, oh, like a spaceship. So she had heard the word spaceship before so it was in her passive vocabulary. She had heard this word, maybe just you know, like, she didn't really understand what it was. Some people were talking about, oh, like a spaceship or something. I don't know where she heard the word, but it's in her vocabulary. Uh, but suddenly, after she understands this, the connection is made. That's where the discovery happens. And that's where you're like, ah, like I got it. You made the discovery yourself, okay? And she will never forget that. So the things that you discover by yourself become really the foundation of the things that, uh, that make it very easy for you to feel confident about things. So notice again, the, the confidence increases as we learn in these different ways. So if you can learn through discovery, and really these top two things, they work together. And as you learn more things and you build your network, that's when you really develop something that you can use fluently without hesitating or feeling uh, like, maybe you're worried about, am I using the word the right way or something? You, you won't be because you've heard all these different examples. All right, does this make sense? So again, the idea is if you want speed immediately, you need to learn something right now. So if someone asks me, hey Drew, how can I learn something for a test? Just get some translations of it if that's what you want to do. So again, it's just for the test tomorrow. You don't care about using anything fluently, just get the translation or the definition. Okay, so, but the ideal thing, this is the way I teach because I want to have, just like my children at home, I want to help you learn the same way because the goal is not just to learn the vocabulary and forget it. You want to learn the vocabulary and have this network and the network becomes very, very powerful. Okay, it's the same idea uh, as a spider web. This is not gonna be the best picture of a spider web, but. So the strength of the spider web comes from all these different connections. It's all of these individual connections and each time you make another connection, it becomes stronger. Because if you lose one, let's say I forget that word, it doesn't matter. I can easily switch to a different one in my mind, okay? So I might know evergreen, I might know timeless, I might know, uh, I don't know, what's another good word for that? Like I could, I could think of maybe a, a few different ways to express that. All right, it's everlasting, another word, all right? So when, a, when we're trying to learn vocabulary, if you get these, it's useful in the short term, but it will hurt you long term, all right? But the more of this you get, the more native lessons, the more discovery you get, this is what really leads you to being able to communicate, all right? 
Any questions about that? Hopefully there are not. Uh, the whole idea of discovery, this is what we do in Frederick. This is why the app is designed for you to play with the language and actually discover how it works for yourself. Because when you do that, you actually remember how the, wor how the, like, the words work and the, the words for sounds or the rules for sounds. Uh, and you build fluency much faster. Okay. So let me go back. Uh, let's see check any uh, questions over here. But that's basically the lesson. Look at that, half hour, amazing. So I will take uh, the rest of the time to answer questions, but this is it. Discovery is the number one best way to learn because just like in persuasion, where you're trying to teach people or get people to believe something, if you can get people to believe it themselves, like they convince themselves it's their idea, it's very difficult to unconvince them of that. All right, if that makes any sense. So this is the most powerful thing if, that we, we most strongly believe the ideas we discover ourselves, okay? So this is true for sales, it's true for anything like that. So like really strong uh, people in sales or persuasion, this is what they're going for. So companies or whatever, they're trying to get you to believe that something is, is, so, is so fantastic that it was your idea, okay? That it came from you, you discovered that, all right? So when we try to tell other people like, hey, your belief in this religion or whatever is wrong, people, they won't listen to that because they, they discovered something for themselves and that's what they want to believe. The interesting thing is it doesn't really matter if you're right or wrong. It's just this is a very powerful part of psychology that will help you learn languages much faster. Okay, So you really drive this. Uh, it's, it's difficult to kind of discover something. I guess you can discover it like from very beginning if you have a, a way of learning like we do in Frederick. So Frederick, we designed it so that even a, an absolute beginner can go through the language and teach themselves like, like very quickly work up through the steps from the alphabet uh, and go up to like a difficult word like cataclysm. Cataclysm. All right, but you can teach that and you discover how it works yourself. And so this is like, I, I remember uh, recently, uh, so I get articles, my mom sends me articles about, you know, the new, from the New York Times or whatever, uh, about people teaching reading. So in the United States, there's a big problem with illiteracy. So this means people are unable to read, like a, a very large portion of the population is unable to read. And people argue about should we do teaching with phonics, which is teaching the sound rules of the language, or should we do it with whole word, which is like, like trying to remember or memorize words by their shape, or maybe something else. So there could be people arguing over different approaches when the truth is you actually need a mix of different things, but the discovery is the key. So what stops people from becoming good readers is actually when we're, we're trying to take them and force them to memorize rules. That's what we're doing down, <coughs> excuse me, down here at the lowest level uh, of teaching. So when we have translations or definitions, this is what we're trying to do when we teach people grammar rules. All right. So this works not just for vocabulary learning, but for grammar, pronunciation, everything else. The point is to lead the student, like if I'm speaking as a teacher to other teachers watching, uh, the point is to lead the student to the point of discovery. Okay. So this is how you do it, again, for grammar, pronunciation, everything, but the point is to get the student to think like, ah, they have their aha moment when they really discover something, okay? I can give another example of this uh, in a moment if people like, but hopefully everyone uh, understands what I'm talking about here and this makes sense. All right, let me go back and uh, answer some more questions here. Suresh, how can I clear the IELTS exam on my own, sir? Uh, I don't focus on particular tests. I would look for people who do. Uh, I focus on conversational fluency, which obviously will help you on any test, but if you're looking for specific tips for specific tests, I would look for uh, people who focus on that. Uh, let's see. So, Claudia, I thought evergreen were used only for tree purpose. Thanks, you, thanks for that. Yes. So, again, this is the interesting thing about you. Like, when you understand the language like this, you understand the language at a native level. That's why I call it a native lesson. So it doesn't mean a native person is teaching, it means it helps you understand like a native. All right, that's really the goal. So when you learn something like that, like I might learn something, I'm trying to think uh, when I, like let's, uh, there was a time, I uh, maybe last year, I think, or two years ago, I made a joke in Japanese uh, where I was, I was kind of using a word 
for a different, like a different purpose. So in the same way that you can use evergreen for talking about something else. So this was, uh, th this was a, a friend of mine. Uh, he was, uh, <laughs> I think he was, he was smoking. So there's a Japanese guy. He was smoking some cigarettes. Uh, and I said, oh, like you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't smoke. And he was like, oh, well, I'm paying taxes. And I said, ah, that's true. It's like, and the, the Japanese word for kind of improving the community is machizukuri. <laughs> and so like when he's saying like machi, like the town or the area to, to make the town better, machizukuri. So I made that joke and I'm using it. And he laughed about that because he's like, ah, I, I took a word like evergreen and used it in a different way, but it's similar. So what happens when you have a native level understanding of vocabulary is you can take words and use them in a new way like that and people will still think like, oh, like I understand what you mean, okay? Even if it's not, like even if no one had ever used evergreen in that way, I could take the word and create it in that way and use it that way and people would understand me, all right? So this is again, another great thing. This is what separates the, the people who are stuck down here, still translating and looking at definitions and the people who are really commanding the language, all right? So you want to have ownership, that's why I call it ownership of the language, because you can actually control it, you can decide what you want to do or how you use the language, and you still use it correctly, all right? Machizukuri. <laughs> yeah, still thought, he, he laughed pretty hard about that. Uh, let's see, so interesting last tool. Yes, if you're talking about discovery up here, yes, this is really the, the fastest way, the most powerful thing you can do. All right, let's see, book reviewer, can you explain the thought process behind making sentences? What should we be thinking while making it? How important tenses are while making a sentence and how to memorize tenses? All right, so I, I do not recommend you try to memorize anything, really. Like memorizing is, again, it's, it's this kind of lower level um, for, for learning anything. It's useful if you need to pass a test. I just need to memorize this information in my short term, very quick memory so I can recall it for a test, but I will probably forget it later. And so if you're talking about making sentences, the sentences come, like you can, you can see me, I'm using sentences and phrases when I'm teaching right now. So I'm doing the same thing. And as you listen to more of those examples, you can start building these sentences yourself. And this is how children are learning the language. So children, uh, typically they begin, uh, like parents are just teaching them very simple words and phrases. And this is another reason why phrasal verbs are a good thing to learn uh, because they're giving you not just a single word, but it's the beginning, like almost the first phrases that a child would learn. So I tell my child, uh, sit up. So the, my, my daughter is, you know, she's sitting in her chair. We're having dinner, uh, but she's kind of like leaning over the table or whatever. She's got her arms up on the table and, and she's, she's kind of leaning like that on the table. And I say, hey, sit up. And I show her an example, like instead of me leaning on the table, I sit up like this. So you can see my back is straight. I have good posture. I'm sitting up. All right. So sit up on the table. Okay, now she can sit there and, and it's much different than leaning forward on the table like that. All right. So here I'm even using, this is like a very simple kind of first sentence. So sit up is a sentence even by itself. Sit up. Sit up. Stand up. Uh, move, whatever. Uh, and so as, as children are learning these examples, they start learning to attach more things to them. And this is how we get sentences. So I can say, sit up, or I can say, sit up, please. Or uh, I could say, like using another phrasal verb, I could say, clean up. So clean up your, clean up your toys, clean up your toys, clean up your toys. If I make this a full sentence, I could just say clean up, or I could be more specific, clean up your toys, or I could say clean up the toys you played with. And as they get these examples, again, this is the, the native lesson with the discovery. This is the natural way that kids are learning to understand the language. All right. And so when you're starting, first you kind of understand something like I am wearing a black shirt. So my children know that, oh, I am wearing a black shirt right now. I'm wearing a black shirt. What color shirt are you wearing? What are you wearing right now? So I'm wearing a black shirt, but yesterday I wore, so let's, let's just make this very simple. So I am wearing, 
So I am wearing a black shirt. And so they learn the past tense, not by memorizing that, but by understanding the situation. All right, so the situation is not today, but yesterday. And like they're thinking to themselves, oh, that's interesting. We don't say I am wearing a shirt, I, like I am doing something. That's only for right now. So they, they recognize that naturally. They won't tell you like, oh, that's present continuous or the past perfect or whatever. They won't be talking about specific grammar rules. All right. They're thinking about situations and connecting that with vocabulary. So they hear in the past like, oh, so I was wearing something. And so, oh, look at that. So I am wearing it right now. I was wearing it yesterday. And as they get more examples of it, again, the, the, the point here is building this network. The network in the mind. The spider web in the mind. And that's what helps you speak. Okay? So it's not trying to memorize rules. It's not trying to practice sentences like that. You really want to get lots of different examples. And you can do this very efficiently by focusing on a particular thing, but it should be getting lots of different examples from different speakers. So you don't only hear me, like my children hear me and my wife and people on TV and someone in a game or on the radio or something like that. So she has, uh, or both of my daughters have lots of different examples of that. All right, so it's not, it's not one thing, like a translation or definition one time. It's a continuous process of more native lessons, so lessons that help you understand like a native, leading to discovery. So as you begin discovering things by yourself, you're like, oh, wow, look at that. Like, now I'm able to, to do all kinds of things. And so for me now, uh, when I was first learning Japanese, I was doing this. I was translating and trying to get definitions of words and then I would forget them. But once I started doing this, that's when I became fluent, all right? And fluency, it wasn't a process that took a long time. Like you can see, even learning a new usage of the word evergreen, you become fluent in that word. So each time you learn a new word or phrase and you understand it like a native, that means you become fluent in that word, all right? So the whole point of this video is how do we, what's the best way to learn vocabulary for fluency? So how do we learn words quickly? How do we learn them easily and actually remember them and understand them like a native? So that way we can speak. All right. All right. Looks like, uh, let's see if I can, if I go back some of these All right here. But hopefully that makes sense. All right. Uh, Drebo says, how's it going? It's going well. My teacher, if I could know the root of the word. Yes. So sometimes like uh, spaced out, like dazed or disoriented. Yes. You also, there's also that meaning. That's right. Uh, Shark says, I am now at work teacher another day. I will comment here or comment more by a good night. All right. So learn the concept through examples. Yes. Okay. I think we got all that now. So it would help to remember words. Yes. So you notice how native lesson, like the, the lesson that helps you understand like a native uh, and discovery, those are really the fastest way to remember words because they become unforgettable in that moment. So when a child is like, ah, or anybody, an adult does the same thing. Like when, when you learn like evergreen means a tree, but we can take that idea of something being green all the time and apply that to something else. It's like, ah, I got it, okay? So the point is to, is to help you with a native lesson so that you discover something. Because when you discover that thing, you really remember it, all right? This is why it's the highest level of vocabulary learning. Now, I think maybe the only thing faster than that would be the matrix where they plug a wire into the back of your brain or something like that. I don't know. We're not at that level yet, uh, but discovery is going to get you the fastest way there so far. Uh, all right. So evergreen, timeless, everlasting. Drew is the best. Yes, I wish I was evergreen. <laughs> I, will, I will not be evergreen at some point, I'm, I'm thinking. All right, Dr. Fatima, amazing lesson. I really love it. May God bless you. Okay, glad to hear it. All right, so people are, people are understanding. I wanted to make this pretty easy. Really, it's just the things that most people do. If you focus on these top two, you're going to get fluent much faster. All right, so this is what we do in Frederick. It's also what we do uh, in Fluent for Life. If you'd like to learn more about those, you can click on the link in the description below this video. All right, Louis says, uh, we are here with you oh, here in Chicago. Oh, that's right. Yes, in Chicago. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been back in Chicago. Johan, I speak in an American accent and people around me 
doesn't understand. So another basic example here, people don't understand. People don't understand. And I'm kind of feeling like my speaking skills are slowly going down. So what should I do to get my speaking skills back up? Uh, I would hear, Johan, lots of examples of native speakers. So if you're, you say you speak in an American accent, but I, does that mean like, are you in America right now? Or are you, are you speaking to other people who don't understand an American accent? I don't know what the specific issue is, but the, the, really the solution to any problem like this is more native lessons. And so you would get more, uh, I didn't even write it on the board today, I'm so used to talking about this, but this is naturally varied. So naturally varied review. Let me write this more clearly or I will get people in the comments yelling at me, I'm sure. <laughs> naturally varied review. Uh, e -W. So this means you're hearing lots of different examples of whatever the vocabulary is or you're hearing different speakers. So you're hearing lots of different native examples. If it's from America, then listen to American speakers. And even in America, there are different accents. So we might have a Texas person versus a Florida or Vermont or you know California. People speak a little bit differently. Uh, and the vocabulary can be different uh, as well. Uh, let's see. All right, next question. Uh, hello, how can I know how to pronounce long words? Where should I stress the word always get it wrong? Uh, what's, a, what's an example of a long word? Uh, typically, if you, if you learn the same way natives learn pronunciation, uh, this is what we do in Frederick. Does anyone have the app already? Let me know if you do and if you like it. Uh, so Frederick teaches you step-by-step step how to make all of these sounds and how to go from the alphabet to pronouncing a long word like apocalypse, okay? So words like, what's a, what's a longer word we have there? Like education, uh, it's a word in the app, I think. Uh, but lots of, uh, or decision, other things. Again, longer words, but I, I don't know how long of a word you're talking about. Compli complication, um, like even longer than that. There are specific rules for how you pronounce these, and so we teach them step by step in the app. So if you'd like to learn that, uh, rather than trying to, 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 to study random words and remember that way, again, the, the goal is to, to build a network in your mind. So you build a uh, like pronunciation network in the same way. All right. Uh, okay, I got that one. Okay, so Maya says, how about I learn vocabulary or... We put on a flashcard can, can be helpful for the to remember or not. Well, flashcards are going to be down here. So a flashcard is going to give you a definition. It's like a one-to-one -one correspondence of something like that. So a flashcard is helpful as part of a network, but you really need the whole the whole thing. So you should be hearing the word in different ways, uh, seeing it in different places. Uh, that's that's how you're going to help. Um, or going to teach yourself or get yourself to remember the word much faster. So again, flashcards are useful, but one example is less powerful than many examples, basically. All right. And Seda says, I can understand everything you say, but I can't speak English. I hope your video lessons help me to do that. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, so uh, the, the problem people have often is that they uh, they do understand a lot. They have a passive vocabulary, but they, they, don't, they don't have the ownership level. So this is really the same kind of idea about developing, owner, developing ownership of the language. And so what people are often doing is they're either learning through translations or definitions. Uh, and even if they learn in English, they're not really learning it to understand like a native and they don't really discover a lot. They, they're often surprised by usages. And they're not like, oh, like, I see how that could work also, which is what natives are thinking when they learn new vocabulary. Um, and so if you understand the language but you don't speak, it's because you haven't been spending enough time with the language. You're not getting enough naturally varied review, and you don't understand it like a native. And so there could be different reasons why, why like, why you stop yourself from speaking, like you forget words, or you don't feel very confident about the vocabulary, you worry about pronunciation or making a mistake, something like that. Again, it means that you didn't really understand the vocabulary. So the easy way to solve that is get more naturally varied review, 
uh, more native lessons. All right, so this is what we do in Fluent for Life uh, and, and Frederick for, for simply learning vocabulary and grammar. All right. And next one, let's see, Raphael says, Hi, teacher, for the first time I can watch you during a live. I only want to thank you for your dispons, dispon, disponibility. Disponibility. Never heard that word. I don't know. I don't know if that's a word or not. But yes, <laughs> I'm guessing that's maybe maybe saying saying thank you. Okay, but I got you. All right, Ramesh. Uh, it's talking to somebody else here. Ramesh. Okay, we're talking. We got a whole separate conversation about Ramesh. All right. Hello, sis. Hello, teacher. Mike. Again, I understand English very well. Okay, I answered that already. Do you recommend using Anki app and do sentence mining? I don't know what sentence mining is, uh, Majdi. Uh, but Anki, again, it's going to be, uh, people talk about spaced repetition, so you would use a, a flashcard system like this, but it's much faster to, to build a network of things, because the network, each time you add, uh, let me erase some of this here, and this is another bit of psychology, powerful psychology for you, so in addition to discovery, the mind gets very difficult or it uh, gets very bored by remembering vocabulary, which is why seeing a flashcard uh, over and over again, it doesn't work. So it, it doesn't work for like a number of reasons and you have to put a lot of pressure on yourself to do that. So if you're a really good student, okay, today I will look at this flashcard 10 times and then tomorrow I will look at it 10 more times and each day you're looking at the same thing. It's possible, but it's much faster and easier to look at 10 different flashcards where we got all different uh, like examples of something. So depending on how, how you're using Anki, uh, like I don't, I don't use that to learn anything. I know some people do. If that's helpful for them, that's good, but I would imagine that's because they don't know about this. But in learning your native language, this is what you're doing. So you're not using flashcards to learn your native language. Uh, so it doesn't make much sense to learn them or use them for learning English. All right, so that's my, my basic thinking about that. So if I'm not using flashcards to learn English words, uh, I mean, I could, it's possible, uh, but if I can actually spend more time building my network in my mind, that's the thing that's going to help me remember and use that vocabulary much faster. All right. Uh, okay, I think I got that one. All right. So El Dorado says, what's the difference between dangle and hang? Mm. I think it's basically the same thing. I mean, dangle is almost, if you think about, I, I can imagine more movement in something that's dangling. So as an example, this is, uh, you, could, you could talk about, and this is a, another way to teach yourself vocabulary. So when you learn new things like this, if I can give you more of a native lesson about hang versus dangle. So let's just say, uh, if we talk about something like if I'm going to hang, I'm going to hang a picture. So the picture, the picture is hanging on the wall like this. Or I could be hanging like if I'm, you know, got like a, doing a pull up or something like that. So I'm hanging on the wall. Dangling is almost like you've got something much, much smaller. Maybe you've got something heavier at the bottom of it and it's swinging a little bit. So you might see a woman. Uh, or somebody, you know, just has like some big uh, hoop earrings. So we draw, draw the face over here. Here's the ear and a big hoop earring that's dangling from her ear. All right. So when natives are thinking about what's the difference between this and this word, this is how they're thinking. They're trying to imagine situations where we might have something. So dangling usually like it's, it seems almost like it could fall easily. Uh, but it's, it's like a lighter thing, or maybe we've got something that it, it moves around a lot more. So hanging seems a little bit stronger. So if I'm, if I'm dangling by, by, uh, by like one hand or one finger from a tree, that might be dangling. All right. But if I'm hanging, it's a little bit stronger. So you can imagine like a, in a, in, 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 in like dangle is a, is like a sub word within hanging words. Like that? Does that make sense? So you like a, a thing that is dangling is also hanging. It's like within that same group of vocabulary. So this earring is hanging from the ear. 
but we talk about it dangling because it's it's kind of light and it might move around. Does that make sense? All right. So look for examples. That, that's the that's the best way to 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 try to find out what exactly something means and to contrast it with other things. But you, again, you notice what I'm doing here. I'm looking at different examples. Like, does an earring dangle? Would we say like a wrecking ball? You know, hanging hanging from a crane. Like, yeah, maybe you could call that. You could call that hanging, or you could say it's kind of dangling. It probably isn't going to blow in the breeze because it's so heavy. Uh, but it's a similar idea. All right. So look for examples of words and when they're used to help you remember them. All right. So thank you for answering my question. Says Book Revere. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. What do you think about shadowing? Uh, I think uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it's useful to do, but it's not as useful as uh, learning a lot more vocabulary and building your network. So shadowing is typically you're getting one example of something and focusing on that one example. So anytime you spend a lot of time focusing on one example, uh, your time is better spent getting many more examples. So it's the, it's the individual single connection versus many. So me personally, I would rather hear uh, 10 different speakers say something than try to shadow one speaker. And the reason is because if I'm just listening to one teacher, like if I'm learning Japanese and I hear one teacher's example, I'm going to really uh, like overcorrect. So meaning I'm going to think about it too much and, and, and really try to focus on sounding exactly like that person. But if I hear a bunch of native examples and each one is different, then it will, it will relax me because I know, okay, my pronunciation is going to be a little bit different from everyone else's. I don't have to try to sound like one person. So the, the point here is the, the listening is connected with the speaking. And so if I hear lots of different examples, that will naturally make me more confident. Uh, it will improve my pronunciation as well. So you can shadow, but most people aren't really thinking about this. Uh, from the naturally very review perspective, but this is exactly how they learn their native language. All right. So all, all of the things that I teach, like all of this stuff here, it's not really a new idea. You're doing it already. You know, I'm just making it clear what it is you're doing in your native language and saying you should do that in English also. All right. All right. Let's keep going. I think we're, we're getting to the end over here. Could be the end. And did you recommend you? Oh, okay. Uh, answer that one. Bye, teacher. It was a pleasure listening to you once in a lifetime. Well, I'm not dying. Or are you dying? Hopefully. Hopefully you're not, you're not dying over there. <laughs> come back. Come back sometime. Uh, I really want to learn a new language, English, but sometime I feel shy. Uh, why I need to learn how ever sometime I ask myself you should learn I know that weird. I want advice. Okay, let me clear that up a little bit. You, it sounds like you want to learn English, but you feel shy about learning English, or you feel shy about speaking the language. I think that's what you're saying. Um, and ask my ask myself if you're asking like learn how I how I should how I should learn. I'm guessing you mean how you should learn, um, but that's what this is. Now the the great thing about this is you don't need to feel shy about it because you don't have to speak. All of the things that I've taught you, like even just one example with Evergreen, uh, you, you, if you understand that, you're thinking, oh, like this, this music I'm listening to is Evergreen. I can listen to it any time or even 20 years from now, it will still be popular. It's Evergreen. And so when you hear something like that, it doesn't matter. You don't need to practice saying the word. You just understand it. All right. That's the power of discovery. So when you learn something and you really understand it, it's like, ah, okay, I don't need to like practice speaking that word. I just know the word and I can use it in a conversation. All right. So the more you can learn like this, so getting uh, lessons that help you understand like a native and then helping you discover more. So the, the like good teaching is giving you a lot of native lessons, which leads to a lot more discovery. All right. And soon you don't even need like lessons anymore because you just understand everything by yourself. Um, <clears throat> All right, Dribo says, how can we use word of account in a sentence different ways? Well, that depends on what, like, account could mean different things. I could have a savings account, uh, or I could have, like, an advertising, 
like account executive. It just depends on what you're learning. And so you, you have to remember, uh, rather than learning a word like that, you have to learn the word for a particular situation. That's how natives do it. And that's the point of having the network. So if I learn a word like account, I could hear maybe how there's like different, different uses of that particular word, but some words they might have, it could be a homonym where it's the same sound like night, K-N-I-G-H-T, K-N-I-G-H-T, and night. And so again, you want to compare uh, different situations, but if it's the same meaning, uh, hopefully that, that should make it a little bit easier. So you want to take one thing and focus on it to really understand that. And once you understand that word, then you can notice how it makes connections with other words or different meanings of that same word. But focus on one thing at a time. All right, Ariel says, I installed Frederick but couldn't pass level one. I figure out lately how to use, I'll figure out later how to use it properly. <laughs> it's pretty easy. You just scroll the wheel. All right, if you look on, uh, look on our channel, for Frederick, uh, just search like, I have a video about uh, learning pronunciation like a native, I forget the name of it, but uh, if you just click on the link in the description uh, below this and it will explain a little bit more. All right, uh, All right. I think I answered that, wait a minute. All right, so I seen a hi there. Did I skip something interesting? I love your classes. Thank you so much. Hopefully I can get your fluency. Yep, so I, I had to get fluency myself. I'm a native speaker, but a native just means I learned the native way. That's it. So it doesn't matter. It's not where I'm from. It's just how I learned. And so other people can do the same thing. It doesn't matter where you live. You can become fluent in anything, just like you got fluent in even one usage of something like how to use evergreen like a native. All right, uh, I think I answered that question about shadowing already. Steven says, so I need uh, to focus only on one word for a week, getting naturally varied review, right? Well, the, I mean, the, the point is to learn something until you understand it. So you don't have to just like review it infinitely. You would focus on one thing and, and even if you don't understand something immediately, you will, you will kind of keep that in your mind and maybe come back to it later. All right, so you don't focus on a word for a week. I mean, you, again, you could learn something very quickly, just like I gave the example of, of Evergreen. You wouldn't really need many more examples. You, you could get more examples, but you wouldn't really need them. Uh, the point is, is to get to like the fluent understanding of it, where you feel confident using it, that's the goal. And then if you can get more examples, that's great, but that probably won't improve uh, your fluency much. It will help you a little bit, but just for using the word. Um, so you don't need to spend that much time on it. But I would spend more time, like in Fluent for Life, we spend a month focusing on a whole, like a whole collection of vocabulary and grammar because it's about one conversation. So even one conversation, there's a lot of information in there and taking, we could even spend a whole year on one conversation because there's a lot of information. But we want to take really the most important things, the most common things, and really focus on those uh, because some of the information, you will hear it again and again anyway. Um, but we spend that much time because there's a lot to learn and we break it into different pieces. So we're going to talk about vocabulary uh, or pronunciation or grammar or other things, and then you see how all of that works together in the conversation. So the goal, don't think about like a specific amount of time. It's just more like, how, how many examples of something do you need to, to really understand it? So typically we get a few different examples just to understand the vocabulary and what it means, like I'm doing in the, with a native lesson. Uh, but we want to have also hearing it from different speakers. So we want to hear different speakers saying that vocabulary, like I might say something and then my sister might say something also. So you're getting to hear more than one person use it. So don't try not to think about it as like, as, as how much time, it's just uh, how well do you understand that information. And it could, be, uh, it could be a minute, it could be a day, it could take longer than that. Good question though. All right, uh, so, 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 Alio, so Alio, thank you for answering my question, yeah, it's my pleasure. Do you teach one-on-one? -on -one? No, I do not. Uh, and as I just explained, the reason I do not teach one-on-one -on -one lessons is because you really should be learning with many different people. So you, the reason we designed uh, Master English Conversation or what became uh, Fluent for Life the way it is is because we really want to have people getting lots of different examples. So you shouldn't only have one teacher. 
you should have many different teachers. One, like a teacher is nice for being able to explain things, uh, but it's often difficult yet to, if you have a good teacher who can give you native lessons uh, and help you discover things, that's great, but really you need to go even higher than that to get to the native level of understanding, which means getting lots of different examples. So you need to have more than one teacher. So I don't, it's also, it'd also be like incredibly expensive if I tried to offer uh, one-on-one -on -one lessons. As a child, Julian says, I struggled to understand English in school due to an English-only teacher, but later learned from a Spanish-English grammar textbook improving my comprehension and ability to communicate why. I'm able to understand you now. Yeah, so you, I mean, it's possible, like you can learn that way. It just takes, it just takes a lot longer. And I would bet that there's a lot of information that you retained from your teacher that later you, you got some kind of lessons about that and it made more sense to you. So that can happen as well. So I might watch a Japanese TV show and hear some vocabulary and not understand it. Like, oh, I don't, I just don't know the words. Uh, but then I hear it in another example later and it makes sense. So again, this is the, the idea of the network. And so it's, it's not like you, textbooks aren't, aren't evil. <laughs> like you could use a textbook and even I will refer to a textbook sometimes just like, you know, for thinking about, oh, like how, how, do, how do these people teach this or whatever. Um, but if, if, it's, if it's just another point in this uh, network that you're building, that's okay. It shouldn't be only the textbook because that's really going to make it more difficult for you. So you can think about it logically, but being able to communicate, you really need to be able to, uh, to do that without spending a lot of time thinking and hesitating or translating in your head. So if it works for you, that's great, but uh, it doesn't work for a lot of people. All right. Let's see, Ding says, uh, the way I learn English that I will summarize all the things I heard or watch and when I do something like cook or makeup, I will talk to myself step by step what I need to do. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to even sit and talk to yourself. Just listen to other people talking about a particular thing, whatever that is. So like you can watch them or read them doing that. This is what we do in Fluent for Life. So you're getting reading and writing, you're getting listening, and you can even try speaking if you want, but that's less important than people think it is. Really, you need to, again, get a lot, of, a lot more examples of things. That's the thing that, that stops a lot of people from speaking. So they might, they might think like, oh, I know that vocabulary already, but then they can't use it in a conversation. So it means they don't really know the vocabulary as well as they think they do. So trying to repeat words again and again is not going to improve your fluency if you're not already fluent. But getting more examples of something will improve your fluency because it's the, it's the network that delivers the fluency. All right, so if I take a word, like if I, if I have two different lessons here and I'm gonna learn the word evergreen, And you'll notice I come back to this word again and again and again because I'm building that network in your mind. So even if you don't speak, I'm building that network for you. So if I hear the word evergreen, I have two options. Well, I have, I guess, many options, but the two main options are, number one, I try to repeat that word again and again. Evergreen, 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 evergreen. I look at a flashcard, it says evergreen, evergreen, evergreen. Okay, so that's one thing I could do. The other thing I could do over here, Option two is to hear different people talking about it, to read it in, in like a comic book, see it on a TV show. See, getting lots of those different examples of what evergreen means is much faster. That's what's really going to build my fluency, all right? So I might have a like, maybe trouble pronouncing the word or something, that might be an issue, but if I hear it again and again with all these examples, that's going to be much faster, all right? So you don't, you don't have to spend time repeating stuff, like shadowing in that way. It, like it, Again, there are lots of things that can be helpful, but if you're trying to get fluent as quickly as possible, you want to be efficient with your learning, you want to be systematic. So we want to take something like, okay, let's learn Evergreen like a native. So we want to have a native lesson of that so we can discover more examples of that when we hear them in conversations, okay? So don't put pressure on yourself uh, to do a lot. It's really just, getting the various information, the naturally varied review. Uh, all right, I answered that one too. 
All right, Mohammed says, unfortunately I was late. Would you please summarize what you said? <laughs> it's right here. These are the four different levels for understanding vocabulary. You can get a translation, which is quick, but it's not going to help you very much. You can get a definition, which is also quick, but it's not going to help you very much because you will likely forget it. The best things you can do are native lessons, and by this I mean understanding something like a native, where you're getting naturally varied review, you're learning lots of new examples, understanding new things, uh, just by getting lots of different examples of that. All right, And you're able to, to discover new things in context. So as an example, uh, let's say I was, uh, I was talking with my mom yesterday. So I was driving her car and I crashed her car. I was driving her car and I crashed, my, I crashed her car. All right. This is not a real story, I'm just making an example. So I was driving her car, I crashed the car, and I, I was going to tell her. Uh, and I thought she would be mad about that. So I thought she would be like, a little bit mad, but she was actually like much, much angrier than I thought she was going to be. She was practically frothing at the mouth. She was practically frothing at the, frothing at the mouth. Now this is a native expression that you might hear. Maybe you've heard this before, maybe you have not. Uh, but the idea, you can imagine, I'm telling a story, so I, I think my mother is going to be angry. So if I can imagine like her anger, her anger level from one all the way up here to, to maximum, like level 10 angry. <laughs> so I'm expecting her to be a little bit angry. You know, it's okay. I, I, I crashed her car, you know, she should be angry about that. But she was much angrier than I expected. She was practically frothing at the mouth, all right? She was that angry. Now, when you hear a word like that, frothing at the mouth, or you hear a phrase, you might be thinking like, okay, I'm trying to understand like frothing at the mouth. What does that mean? Does anybody understand what that phrase means? So in this example, you're hearing uh, probably some new vocabulary to be frothing at the mouth. And in the situation, the first thing is, okay, I'm connecting this vocabulary with the situation. So frothing at the mouth must mean somebody is really, really angry, okay? Now, again, I'm, this is if you're just like listening to something, you just hear some new vocabulary by yourself. The point you're, you're getting, not really like a native lesson, you're, you're kind of discovering a little bit about something, you're learning something in context. So you hear the situation is describing someone who's very angry. They're practically frothing at the mouth, frothing at the mouth. But then later, maybe another day, you're kind of thinking about the vocabulary. You, you remember it a little bit, and then you see a dog. You see a dog outside, and it's, there's like a, it's, it's in a fight. Or, you know, there's like two people walking their dogs. So one person has their, their dog over here. Pardon my dog pictures. Another person has their dog over here, and the dogs don't like each other very much. And so they're kind of like, and you know, when dogs, they get really, really angry, they like, you see the, the spit, the saliva is like, it's a little bit, a little bit bad to kind of do this on camera, but it's like, you know, you can see stuff, little bubbles and things coming out of their mouth. They're frothing at the mouth. So the froth. So if I have a, a cold glass of beer or something like that with some bubbles on the top. That's the froth up there. So froth. So they're frothing at the mouth. So you might, the first time you hear it, you, you don't really understand what's happening. You can get a, a sense for it probably means to be very angry. But as you see another example or here, you get a native lesson. So this was a native lesson trying to help you understand the vocabulary. All right. So when you talk about someone frothing at the mouth, it's like a dog that's really angry. You know, they like is, and now you will not forget the word or the expression in this case. All right. So when you're learning new vocabulary, I'm trying to answer a few different questions at the same time. But the basic idea uh, is that even if you, you're learning something by yourself, you might not understand it perfectly at first. Uh, but when you continue to get more examples of it, then it will make sense. And that's 
where you're trying to get to the discovery level. Like, ah, now I really understand the vocabulary. Okay. All right, let's see here. I think I have time for yeah, a few more questions. All right. Uh, oh, I think we got the last one here. So Julian says, Chat GPT gave this example. After the controversial decision was announced, the coach was seen frothing at the mouth, screaming at the referee and accusing him of bias. Yeah. So again, if you put, like, you can use Chat GPT or just Google. I mean, even if you don't have Chat GPT, it's like frothing at the mouth. Now, if you do a Google image search for frothing at the mouth, I bet you will see some pictures of dogs like, you know, and like the little bubbles are coming out, you know, the, the spit, the saliva, that's the name of that, um, coming out of their mouth. But again, that's how you would get more examples of that thing. And it's, it's more examples, not, not just like reading the word again and again or reading the phrase again and again. All right, so if I have a flashcard and I write frothing at the mouth and I re repeat that again and again, so which is going to be more helpful? Repeating the same exact thing or getting more examples of related things that help me like actually use it fluently and understand that thing, all right? The point is to improve my understanding with every example. And when you just repeat something, you're not doing that. All right. So this is why I don't recommend just using flashcards. If you're using flashcards with something else, maybe there's a picture on that and you're also getting lots of other examples, that's great. All right. But just using flashcards by itself is going to be less helpful, most likely. All right. Look at that. We got through all of the questions and that's good because you can hear me losing my voice over here. Pardon me for a quick sip of water. I'm trying to froth at the mouth a little bit. All right. But you get it. Hopefully you should not forget that word. If you think about frothing at the mouth, you talk about froth in a beer glass like that, it becomes more memorable each time you're getting a related example. So not the exact same thing, but a related one. All right. Google that. Do a Google image search for frothing at the mouth. I'm going to do that right now. See what I get. should be... Pretty simple, we'll go to Google and just type in, we'll go to do an image search. So if I just type in frothing at, it comes up as an autocomplete. I go to images <laughs> and there we go. Yep, so you get some people brushing their teeth and they're like, you know, you see the froth coming out from, from brushing your teeth, same thing, another example. So now we've got the froth in the beer glass. We've got the froth from brushing your teeth, the froth from you being uh, angry like that. Arr, arr. Okay, so you can do these things yourself. It's much better. Obviously, it takes more time if you're trying to do it by yourself to get varied examples. This is why we take care of all this hard work for you in uh, Fluent for Life. So all this is done for you. You just get to enjoy native lessons and discover more for yourself. And that's how you feel more fluent. All right. Well, it looks like we got no more questions, which is great. Everybody understood? And I can end the lesson. All right. Well, hopefully, remember, we're trying to get naturally varied review. The point is to go from translating and getting definitions for things to actually understanding things like a native so you discover more of the language all by yourself. When you do that, each time you do that, you will feel the learning happening and you will feel much more excited about speaking. All right. Of course, we get one more question. <laughs> All right, Maggie says, uh, by different examples, do you mean highlighting new words in different contexts? I mean the same word or the same phrase. You want to attack something from as many angles as possible until you understand it. It could be one example. Maybe you really understand something from a very good example and you just understand it. Like if I hold up the color blue and the color black and the color red. Like here, you don't need a thousand examples of colors because you just understand what I'm talking about. You might need to hear it a few times like, oh, it's a red marker or a red truck or something in order to remember the vocabulary. Uh, but that's how you're going to become uh, much more fluent where you're learning uh, related examples about a particular thing, all right? So we want to hear the same word uh, or the same phrase, uh, but we might hear it in different ways, different contexts, different examples, and different speakers. Uh, let's see. So Yuvan says, I can understand while watching your videos and many other YouTubers, but sometimes I can't even catch a word when I watch a movie. Yep. And again, like this is what we do in, uh, in Fluent for Life, because we want to take you from understanding as 
uh, as a learner, and I'm speaking intentionally more clearly, uh, and I'm not, you notice I, I don't use any like extra uh, phrasal verbs or idioms or slang or any of that in the same way that I would speak with someone. So I might use like a cultural reference or a movie quote or something like that when I'm speaking with other people. So people who understand that. So you want to match the, the level of English for the people you're speaking with. All right. So if you're trying to understand movies and things like that, you need just more naturally varied review and more examples like we do uh, in Fluent for Life where we're leading you from this kind of slower, easier English to understanding natives. And then you can enjoy movies and things like that. Uh, let's see. I do not have discipline, although I know very well that I will benefit me in the future. Do you have any advice? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so for people who lack discipline, so discipline meaning like the, the ability to, to continue doing something uh, even if you don't want to do it. Uh, what I would recommend is that language learning should actually be fun if you're learning it like you're learning your native language. And rather than having discipline to try to sit and uh, memorize vocabulary or read grammar books that aren't actually helping you, uh, think about the things that you actually enjoy doing. So usually what happens is a person will have an interest in something. So who just made that comment? Let's see. Uh, Asar, if I'm pronouncing that, oh, it's like a like an interesting script you got there. So if you if you have an interest, so let's say you enjoy like me, I enjoy I don't know fishing or gardening or whatever. You will naturally want to learn more about that thing. Uh, I remember a, kind of a funny joke. A comedian was talking uh, about how he had it, like he's I don't know this comedian was maybe 20 years old and a, a younger cousin of his was coming to visit his house. And this little kid brought his uh, Pokemon cards. So the little, you know, cards with characters on them. Uh, and the kid was like, look at this, like this Pokemon does this. And it's like all this, you know, it's got like lightning and this level of health and he's explaining all this stuff. And the, the older guy is just, he's sitting there, he doesn't care really what, like what, he's just listening to the kid, right? And so after the kid was finished, then he said, oh, come here. Like the adult says this to the kid. He says, come here, I want you to, I want you to like check this out with me. And he brings him into the bathroom and he shows him a bunch of like hair care products. <laughs> And so he's having a little bit of fun with the kid, but he's like, look at this, like this hair care product, this one, like you wash your hair two times with this and it makes your hair stronger. And, you know, he's basically comparing these, uh, these like hair care things to, to Pokemon or whatever. And the truth is like both of them are meaningless, but both of them are also interesting. It just depends on, on who the person is. So you, you likely have things that you enjoy doing and you don't require any discipline to do that. So what I'm saying is that you should do the same thing for learning English. So what we do in Fluent for Life is you pick a particular thing you're interested in and learn about that. So if you like learning about, I don't know, the military, or you like learning about family life, or you like learning about, I don't know, makeup or, you know, whatever, anything like that, that's the thing that you would focus on. So you, you become fluent in that vocabulary, which you can then use to talk about other things. So if you, if you feel like you're putting pressure on yourself, like you require discipline to do something, uh, you're probably not doing it the right way. It should be fun, it should be easy and interesting for you, the same way it is for you learning things in your native language. So that's a good question, honest question. Uh, but remember, if you're feeling like you're putting pressure on yourself, uh, you should be relaxing and actually enjoying the process. All right. So hopefully people are watching, like when, when people watch my videos, does it take discipline to sit and watch my video? Are you like, man, I don't want to watch this video. Why am I watching this? You know? <laughs> it should be fun because I'm helping you learn things and, and you actually understand the information. Uh, if it's not fun, you should not be watching the video. Nobody is forcing you to do this. Uh, but that's how you should be thinking about language learning. So find things you're interested in and learn about those. Uh, all right, let's see. And all right, so Muhammad says, how should the sound after T sound in this that sentence? At the mouth, at the mouth, the mouth, the mouth, the mouth. If you'd like to hear me pronouncing uh, over 2,000 words and sentences, get Frederick. You can listen to me and learn the same pronunciation the same way my kids do. 
Julian says, I appreciate your guidance, professor. Just let you know I am not a professor. I know people, people use that term. I think it means like teacher in other languages, uh, like Spanish. Uh, but yes, just to let you know, like I, like I, 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 I interesting, uh, uh, yeah, like think, think when, when people, people call me that, like, I'm like, no, no, I'm not a professor. I, I don't want you to think about me like, a, I'm, like I'm a professor. Think about me more as like a, like a parent trying to help, um, help people, help kids. Uh, and our interactions have helped me gain confidence in speaking, but I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Dancy says, I like UFC, so I did what you teach us and took some words and phrases that they repeat and learn those expressions. There you go. Perfect. And then you can use that information likely to talk about other things. See how easy that is? All right, Nelson, so the best way to learn vocabulary to be fluent is to read definition in English and then in context phrases. No, I, like, ignore, ignore, I mean, you can get the definition if you want to, but the definition comes as, as part of the discovery as you get more examples of that thing. That's how you should be learning it. So it's not trying to stay and uh, like focus on the definition of something. Can I say something about the discipline to study English? In my personal, I'm lazy and I don't have the discipline as well. I try to change my environment uh, around me in English uh, and it's helped a lot. Yeah, so some people do that too. But uh, you, you shouldn't need to trick yourself. Think about most people if they say like, oh, that person lacks discipline. They probably have discipline for something they enjoy doing. So if you look at children, like some children don't want to sit and do this thing, but they will sit and do this other thing over here. So it's not a discipline problem. It's more like an alignment problem about people doing something that either in, in a way that they don't like doing it or they're, they're doing it with a subject they don't like. But it's possible to make a connection between language and what you do like because that's how you do it in your native language. So like the UFC example, if you, you probably watch UFC, maybe you listen to announcers in a different language, you can listen to them in English. And again, UFC is great because it's going to give you naturally varied review. You're going to get example after example of different fights. Oh, he really punched that guy or he kicked that guy or did something like that. You will hear these different announcers and you will hear uh, lots of different examples. So that's a great way to get that, get that review. Akhil uh, says, why don't you focus on few words in one video and try to utilize them for several contexts so we can wrap our head around them? Well, that's what I do. So you noticed uh, I spent like, my goodness, over an hour and just focusing on a few things. So we have the word evergreen. And the point is to build a, uh, build a network in your head of different examples. But this, I mean, these kinds of videos that I do on YouTube, also there are ways for me to answer questions. So I'm not like, I, I was just talking about different ways of learning vocabulary at the beginning of the video. And then people had a bunch of questions for me. So that's why I'm staying to answer those. Uh, but typically like in an actual lesson, like I do in Fluent for Life or whatever, or the visual guide to phrasal verbs, uh, that's, what, that's what we're doing. So it's, it's focusing on a particular thing and getting a lot of naturally varied review without me spending time like talking about stuff. <laughs> but yes, that's, that's part of it. Uh, so if you're not a teacher or a professor, how would you call what you do for all of us? I'm the English fluency guide. I created my own term because I didn't really like what other people were using. Uh, and I thought this was the best way to describe it. Uh, so you're a great teacher and father, I believe. Uh, you remind me of Henry Higgins from Pygmalion. Such an innovative way of learning a language you have. Yes. Remember, though, it's not innovative. <laughs> I'm, I'm not being innovative at all. The, the thing I'm doing is reminding people that this is how they got fluent in their native language, and they should probably apply that to learning English. That's it. Because the, most of the, the education, instruction, you know, whatever you want to call it, is in the traditional way where we're doing this stuff down here, translations and definitions. But in your native language, you learn a lot and you're learning more every day by getting lessons that help you understand like a native and you discover a lot more by yourself. All right. So thank you. I appreciate the compliments. Uh, but really, I haven't, haven't done anything uh, different that other people hadn't already found out and that everybody isn't doing already. It's just that most people don't think to do it for English. <clears throat> All right. Uh, does that apply uh, on the language chunks or only applies in words? Yeah, it applies to everything. So just like the UFC example, that's like ultimate fighting championship, I think. Um, so you, you can learn about a topic. 
So if you go to our YouTube channel, go to the, go to the espresso video, and that's one example of naturally varied review where we're focusing on a topic rather than a particular word or phrase. So when you focus on a topic, you will hear phrases used again and again. Like in making espresso, if I show four different people making espresso, they will use a lot of the same vocabulary. And as you hear these different things, you will feel more confident about using the vocabulary too. Uh, I find it easy to understand concrete nouns because I can associate them with an image or object. However, I struggle when it comes to intangible nouns such as uh, solidarity. Sure. Yeah, Julian, we had, a, we had an interesting time with this when building Frederick. So there are a lot of things that are figurative or like, how do we, how do we do like captive? How do we do that? So like one of the, the icons that we have in there, we have icons for every word in the app. And so it took a while to think about someone. I think we did like, I think we did like a 95% job on that. There are probably some things we could do better, but like one example, uh, like let's say we have the word freedom, you know. So you could have, and, and, we, and another thing that's important for Frederick and for learning again is we want to give you different multiple examples. So we don't just give you one icon, we give you four icons for each word. So we went back and did like thousands of extra icons just to help people understand the vocabulary. Uh, so if you have like, you know, imagine like, you know, something, we have a, like a fish bowl over here. So imagine that's a fish. Uh, but we remove the fish bowl, and we just have the fish by itself, and we're like, okay, it's this example. So this is like this one is this fish is free, this fish is captive, or whatever. And so we can we can do that, and it's like you you could maybe think of other examples for what that might mean, uh, but that's why we want to give you more examples of other like freedom or other things like that. What what that what might. Uh, that mean. So yeah, it's a, it's a common problem, but uh, as, you, as you get to the higher level for native lessons and discovery, that's where you really feel much more confident uh, and you get more, more examples in real life about things like that, uh, and it will help you understand that. So getting just one example would be difficult, but uh, you can get a lot more. Uh, it's useful to read a book in my language uh, and read it in English. Yes, you could do that. That's a kind of form of translating. Uh, but again, if you get lessons that you understand, you can learn everything all in English, the same way kids do. All right, so you are still learning new things in your native language all the time without needing to translate anything. All right, do you think a person, uh, Dancy says, who English isn't his native language can teach students in this particular way? Yeah, I don't see why not. I can teach you Japanese and, and not be a native Japanese speaker, and I still teach you the same way. So I've done this before. I haven't done this lesson in a while, but maka, 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 maka. Maka janai, maka janai, janai, ne? Maka, 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 shatsu, shatsu. Kuroi maka, kuroi shatsu. Ao, aka, kuro, kuro, kuro. Kuroi shatsu, kuroi maka. Aoi maka, akai maka, kuroi maka. Pretty easy. So even if my, maybe my, I know someone could say, well, his pronunciation is right. It's like, uh, even native Japanese speakers, like some people speak more clearly, some people do not speak as clearly, you know. But this is, again, how you can teach someone the language, and it's much better for you than trying to do it the traditional way. But I'm not a native Japanese speaker. I can still give you a native Japanese lesson. All right, but that's a good note to end on, I think. We've got all the questions there before I lose my voice completely, but thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure, hoping, uh, hopefully, you have improved a little bit. I'm trying to give you more examples each time, and the more lessons you watch, uh, the more you will get more naturally varied review and feel a lot more confident about it. I love watching video games, but how can I learn from it? Watch people talking about video games. So watch, watch like Let's Play videos about people playing video games. All right, pretty easy. But you can figure it out. There's lots of things you can read, information about. Oh, Tsubasa says, I love your Japanese. Ah, arigatou gozaimasu. Yoroshiku ne. Oh, mo maraka, mo beikyou shinai to ikenai kero ne. Oh, do you think pronunciation is also related to confidence? Yeah, all these things. Nice to see you there, Charles. 
so of course, if you if you don't feel confident about something, uh, if you will of course feel you know whether that's your pronunciation or your grammar or whatever, uh, of course you will you feel a little bit nervous about speaking. So me, if I'm like uh, if, I, if I'm trying to speak Japanese, if I have a lot of confidence, maybe it doesn't matter if my pronunciation is so good, I could say, uh, konnichiwa, uh, konnichiwa, watashi wa, uh, doru, ba, ja, desu. So if I'm speaking badly, speaking bad Japanese, like maybe I have a lot of confidence. And the nice thing about Japan is people won't say anything to me. <laughs> they will say something later about me. They will say, man, his Japanese, like he's, he spoke correctly, but his pronunciation was pretty bad. All right. But most Japanese people would not say anything like in person to me like that. But in English, like people might. <laughs> I apologize for that. But yes, in English speakers, like if you're in America and people... Like you're, you're saying something and, and, and you don't pronounce it correctly. It's like, what did you say? Can you say that again? And people get a little, not angry, but they might be a little bit annoyed by that. But many people will still be nice though. All right. But again, yes, uh, pronunciation. If you have poor pronunciation or poor grammar or whatever, uh, that's going to hurt your confidence and your ability to speak. But you don't have to feel nervous if you just get more examples. All right. Hadri, you're doing a great job. Thanks for all. Hello, my best teacher. How are you doing today? I'm Youssef from Morocco. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you there. All right, now it's really time to end this. What time is it? Yes, I got to get going anyway. You guys are stealing all my time like, a, like time vampires. Time vampires. That's, that's another good phrase you can, you can remember, a time vampire. <laughs> I don't feel bad, though. I really enjoy teaching, but it, it, does, it does a job on my voice. I'll have to get some, I don't know, some honey or something after this. All right, so Euglish will be so helpful in line of what you say. Yes, Euglish uh, is a good thing you can use to listen to lots of different examples of things, but remember uh, to read them, write them, uh, listen to them, just find them in different ways, and, and the more examples you get, the better. So again, this is the kind of thing we have both in Frederick uh, and in Fluent for Life, and we have links to both of those below this video. Have a fantastic day. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.